Video-assisted thoracoscopic lobectomy, prevention and management of intraoperative events. I have no disclosures. The objectives of this talk are to identify helpful transitioning maneuvers in video-assisted thoracoscopic lobectomy, to review potentially dangerous situations and how to manage them, and to review several sample cases of video-assisted thoracoscopic lobectomy events. To start with the basics, it is important not to get in a hurry or plan too much when scheduling a video-assisted thoracoscopic lobectomy. When you begin doing this procedure, start with one a day and do not put too much pressure on yourself. Never lose vigilance. Do not be cavalier about the learning curve. As you acquire the knowledge and skills necessary to perform VATS lobectomy, you will find that attention to detail, meticulous attention to detail, can keep you out of harm's way and prevent problems intraoperatively and often avoid them. Always remember the importance of the team. If the team is weak, you are weak. Train your team and train your team to handle emergencies before they happen. Remember that conversion is not failure. Practice as a group and plan for intraoperative events. Remember, the best way to avoid an unexpected event in surgery is to prevent it. Always back the camera away during an event to prevent blood spillage on the screen. Be aware of the tension both you and your assistant are placing on the lobe, and immediately when an injury occurs, take away the retraction, fold the lung down onto the pulmonary artery, and prevent the bleeding. Allow gravity to tilt the lung posteriorly and out of the way, and if bleeding is found, use a small sponge to compress the area of bleeding. There are many different intraoperative events that can happen during a surgery. These can include deflation of the lung, inability to locate a lesion, inability to see the target, bleeding from the pulmonary artery or the pulmonary vein or the lung parenchyma, airway separation or stenosis, space problems with poor re-expansion of the lung, leak from the airway or bleeding, or other. The first event I will review is that of a 70-year-old man who had a history of malignant melanoma. He was found to have a lesion in the right upper lobe that was speculated and suspicious and enlarging over time. A PET scan revealed increase in SUV and FDG activity. The patient also had a history of histoplasmosis. His mediastinum was found to be negative. We elected to perform a wedge resection followed by completion video assisted thoracoscopic lobectomy if the lesion was cancer. The lobectomy details are shown in the following video. The patient had a video assisted thoracoscopic right upper lobectomy with the ports in the place on the left side of the diagram. There were two ports in the anterior axillary line and there was one port in the posterior axillary line. The beginning of the surgery starts with the posterior mediastinal dissection. Taking the lymph nodes at this time also allows visualization of the posterior mediastinum as well as the pleural surface being cleared to allow for dissection of any lymph nodes between the right upper lobe bronchial takeoff between, interposed between the right upper lobe and the pulmonary artery. The superior mediastinum is encircled as the pleural surface is taken away from the superior aspect of the right upper lobe pulmonary artery branches and clears away the inferior aspect of the azagous vein. The second step in a VATS right upper lobectomy involves flipping the lung back posteriorly and performing the rest of the surgery from the front to the back. The first portion of the surgery will involve dissection of the right upper lobe branches of the pulmonary vein. Once these have been encircled, stapled, and divided, the truncus anterior, posterior ascending pulmonary artery, and bronchial branches can easily be seen. Technical considerations when performing endoscopic stapling include preventing complications by releasing tension on the vessel when stapling, encircling the main pulmonary artery whenever you are concerned about an arterial dissection that may be risky, and beware of lymph node erosion into the vessels. Do not continue to dissect when there is bleeding and you cannot see. Apply a coagulant or pressure and go somewhere else to work for a while and then come back to the space. The next step in a video-assisted thoracoscopic right upper lobectomy involves dissection, encircling, and stapling and dividing the truncus anterior branches of the right upper lobe. These can be taken all at once or separately. 
This particular patient had three separate truncus anterior pulmonary artery branches, and they were each taken individually because of the densely adherent lymph nodes. The last two steps in performing a right upper lobectomy involve division of the bronchus and the posterior ascending pulmonary artery. The illustration shows clear division of the right upper lobe bronchus. Sometimes it's easier to take the posterior ascending pulmonary artery first and then the bronchus. Other times it's easier to do it in reverse order. Event number one, video assisted thoracoscopic right upper lobe. During this surgery, you'll see dissection of the mediastinal lymph nodes as the beginning portion of the surgery. Once the four R lymph nodes have been taken and the inferior pulmonary ligament lymph nodes have been taken, attention is directed towards taking the subcrinal lymph nodes. And you can, in the video, you can see the azygous vein in the top left corner. We have dissected the subcrinal lymph nodes and now are dividing the fissure between the right upper lobe and the right middle lobe. By dividing this portion of the fissure with a stapler, it makes it easy to distinguish the demarcation zone between the upper and middle lobes while encircling, stapling, and dividing the right upper lobe pulmonary vein branches. We can clearly see that those pulmonary vein branches going to the right middle lobe have been preserved. Once the pulmonary vein branch has been divided with a gray load stapler, one can turn their attention towards dividing the pulmonary artery branches. It's important when pulling the stapler out to make sure that all the tissue has been divided and to prevent rapidly removing the stapler and inadvertently de tearing the pulmonary artery. The first branch of the pulmonary artery truncus has been divided and a second branch is now being taken. A tan load curve tip stapler is used in this particular incidence, and as the second branch of the truncus anterior of the pulmonary artery is taken, it is now evident that there is a third branch. All of the branches can be taken all at once if you go a little bit more proximal to the hilum, or they can be taken separately if there is concern, or if there is a densely adherent lymph node and dissection is not safe. There now remains a densely adherent lymph node that is located between the truncus anterior branch of the pulmonary artery and the base of the pulmonary artery. This lymph node sits just in front of the bronchus that needs to be divided. By completely removing this lymph node, it is now easy to identify a very small branch that is directly adjacent to the posterior ascending pulmonary artery. That very small branch was too small to staple and was merely coagulated. The truncus anterior is completely divided, the pulmonary veins are divided, and the posterior ascending pulmonary artery branch has just been encircled, stapled, and divided. Once the posterior ascending pulmonary artery branch has been taken, the only remaining structure left to be divided from the hilum remains the bronchus. It is important to make sure when passing the stapler that you're going completely around the bronchus and not through the bronchus or into the lung parenchyma. Taking tension away during stapling will help you to avoid problems. Once the bronchus has been divided, you can now identify that the very small branch coming off of the main pulmonary artery has not been clipped or stapled. At this point, there was concern about this small branch. As I warned them about possibility of too much tension, the small artery branch was avulsed. We applied direct pressure to that area of the pulmonary artery that started to bleed. There was concern about the area dissecting more proximally onto the main pulmonary artery. The team then began to make sure that we had optimal visualization, and as pressure was applied, suction was used to evacuate any residual blood. The ring clamp was used to apply direct pressure, and this was not as adequate as we had hoped. Therefore, a sponge stick was used with the tonsil sponge on the tip of a ring clamp, and this successfully allowed the team to acquire the necessary supplies to manage the emergency. We got blood into the room, notified anesthesia of the issue, and applied a topical coagulant. In this case, Arista was used. Direct pressure to the area of bleeding with a small, bulky sponge that applied discrete pressure as well as the topical coagulant allowed for us to safely acquire hemostasis in this situation. In most cases of pulmonary artery bleeding, simply taking the stretch off of the vessel, removing the pressure, adding a procoagulant, and applying pressure and waiting a while 
will allow the team to acquire safe hemostasis and often will not even require a repair. While we waited for the topical coagulant to do its work, we completed the right upper lobectomy as all of the hilar structures had already been divided. By working in another area while the topical coagulant was applied to the pulmonary artery, we were able to allow time to pass but yet at the same time made sure we were not retracting on the hilum. We completed the stapled fissure of the right upper lobe, placed the right upper lobe into a, an endocatch bag, and removed the right upper lobe from the chest. During this entire time, we were able to ensure that there was no bleeding from the pulmonary artery. We set a clock to make sure that we allowed enough time to pass such that the team was safely ensure that there was no residual bleeding in the pulmonary artery. One of the biggest fears a surgeon may have when performing VAT surgery is pulmonary artery bleeding. In general, this is not a problem, as most bleeding stops with pressure. The pulmonary artery is a low-pressure system. It is important to stay calm during the event. Training the team to release retraction immediately will prevent the surgeon from causing more problems by pulling back to see better and tearing the pulmonary artery worse reaction to the injury can sometimes cause more of a problem than the injury itself. Compress the area with a sponge or a pledget. Do not use a kitner for small holes in the pulmonary artery as this may make it larger. Use a topical coagulant like Arista, surgical cellulose, or any other procoagulant between the injury and the compression to enhance blood clot formation. It is important to know how to avoid events that cause pulmonary artery bleeding from the start. Some of the things that a surgeon can do prior to surgery is to ensure that the patient does not have pulmonary hypertension. Patients who have enlar enlarged pulmonary arteries, often pulmonary arteries that are larger than the aorta, should raise marked concern. A right heart catheterization can be performed, and an echocardiogram can also measure the pressure within the pulmonary artery. If bleeding is encountered in the pulmonary artery, using a sponge that is bulky beneath the clamp will help to ensure better pressure and better coagulation. Using a sponge where the ring goes up to the edge of the sponge and the sponge is not bulky between the ring and the bleeding will often make it more difficult to stop any bleeding. In particular, I prefer a tonsil sponge as it is bulky and big enough so as to not enlarge a hole but at the same time bulky enough to apply pressure to the artery. Event number two begins with the history of a 53-year-old man who was a never smoker who presented with the history of a colorectal cancer that was diagnosed in February of 2014. He developed a left lower lobe lesion that appeared in the lung and gradually grew over time. He had undergone a wedge resection to diagnose the lung cancer and found that it was actually a lung primary instead of a colorectal metastasis. Completion left lower lobectomy was indicated. When performing a VATS left lower lobectomy, we begin by taking the posterior mediastinum and all the lymph nodes that can be evaluated. The inferior pulmonary ligament is then taken down and the pulmonary vein is encircled, stapled, and divided as the lung is retracted superiorly. Once the pulmonary vein is divided, you can encircle, staple, and divide the left lower lobe, bronchus. It is important when going around the bronchus to remember that the pulmonary artery is just on the other side. Although this is not the sentinel event yet, we would like to demonstrate using the leader going around the left lower lobe bronchus, which is the key hugging the bronchus to stay away from the artery. Using an instrument to safely pass behind the bronchus hugging the bronchus to make sure that it does not protrude into the artery as the lung is retracted superiorly towards the head. Once the clamp is able to be passed behind the bronchus and opened, it is important to be very careful about then closing the clamp to ensure that no branches of the pulmonary artery have been caught inside the clamp as it is then withdrawn. A red rubber catheter or a silk can be passed through this passageway to enhance enlargement of the passageway. 
or to lead a stapler. Once the bronchus has been successfully divided, the last structure to be divided is the pulmonary artery. Our event took place during encircling, stapling, and dividing the remaining pulmonary artery after the bronchus and vein had already been taken. In the video, you will see details about the critical mistake that was made while passing the stapler around the pulmonary artery. The critical error that occurred during this case was simply pushing too hard. I did not follow visual cues, although I did recognize immediately when the injury occurred. I had tremendous resistance when trying to pass the stapler and did not recognize that my stapler was not completely around the pulmonary artery, avulsing a branch going to the left upper lobe. I immediately recognized that my stapler had caused an injury by me misdirecting it and applied pressure at the hilum. By compressing the hilum and attempting to get control, we had at least three minutes prior to firing the stapler for anesthesia to come into the room, for blood to be brought into the room, and for me to ask for another partner to come into the room to assist in the case. Once we were sure we were ready, we fired the stapler and not before. Immediately, massive blood loss ensued and my left hand was inserted into the opening of the left chest. While we were waiting, we had already enlarged the opening to make sure that my hand would easily fit into that space where the thoracotomy had been performed. Whenever encountering pulmonary artery bleeding, you have multiple options depending on the volume of blood that is being lost. Initially, if you're able to compress the lung and stop all bleeding, you can simply wait and see if the bleeding stops by re-examining the area. You can consider a video-assisted thoracoscopic repair if visualization is excellent and the bleeding can be controlled. When performing a VATS repair using a knot pusher, a needle driver, both will enhance your ability to close the vessel. It is important not to pull up and cause the tear to be larger and always avoid clamping the vessel. Whenever bleeding such as this occurs, as shown in the video just prior, it is important to immediately gain access to the hilum. By extending the utility incision, a hand can easily be inserted in between the ribs or a traditional posterolateral approach can be taken. If a video-assisted thoracoscopic repair is not possible, one may want to consider open options. These, again, may be extension of the anterior thoracotomy or creation of a separate posterolateral thoracotomy. If a clamp inserted through the camera port can be used to control the bleeding, then simply enlarging the anterior thoracotomy is likely best, as was done in this case. This illustration clearly shows the key maneuver that allowed us to acquire hemostasis and perform a repair such that the patient was able to not only survive, but only had a left lower lobectomy and the left upper lobe was salvaged. By placing the hand through the enlarged anterior utility port, which became an anterior thoracotomy, I was easily able to insert my hand between the ribs encircle the hilum of the lung, and stop the bleeding. By placing the left hand through the wound and using palpation alone to grasp the hilum of the lung and clamp down on the hilum, no more blood loss occurred. Because of the amount of bleeding and the rapidity with which we had to immediately control the bleeding, we were not able to videotape the repair. However, through the extended anterior thoracotomy, we were easily able to pass a chitwood clamp through the camera port to meet the fingertips at the hilum and slide the clamp up along the hilum to obtain control of the bleeding vessel. We were then able to retract the lung anteriorly and use a 5-0 proline suture to close the small hole that had been created in the posterior branch of the left upper lobe pulmonary artery that was going away from the stapler but that had been avulsed. The remaining staple for the left upper lobe pulmonary artery was intact. The pulmonary artery to the lower lobe staple line was also intact. By dividing the small amount of remaining fissure, the left lower lobe was brought out through an endocatch bag, again through the anterior utility port, 
that was enlarged to a thoracotomy. The patient had no further blood loss and had an extended stay because of the pain from his thoracotomy, but otherwise has had an uneventful recovery. The important key maneuver in addressing this complication or this intraoperative event is to make sure that the bleeding is immediately stopped. To recognize when the injury occurs prior to blood loss. To call a supportive team into the room to assist during addressing the problem. To alert anesthesia that a problem may have occurred. To bring blood into the room and make sure that it is appropriate that every piece of equipment that is needed to address the cause of the bleeding is available during the case. Event number three includes how to avoid an injury. This patient was a 52-year-old woman who presented with shortness of breath in April of 2014. She had coronary artery disease and underwent a coronary artery bypass graft in May of 2014. She had a patent left mammary, which can be seen on the sagittal CT scan in the left upper portion of the picture. She had a left upper lobe lung nodule that was diagnosed and increasing in size on serial CT scan. This was a biopsy proven 2.3 centimeter adenocarcinoma that was staged as a T1B N1 M0 stage 2A non-small cell lung cancer. The patent mammary creates a problem when performing a left upper lobectomy, specifically because maintaining patency of the mammary will ensure that the patient does not have any untoward cardiac events. It is described by many other VAT surgeons prior to this, where stapling the lung off of the patent mammary can allow the patient to have an uneventful VAT lobectomy. Although a small rim of lung is left adjacent to the mammary, there are no reports of increase in recurrence of the lung cancer, specifically in this case because the tumor is well far away from that area. However, it was necessary to take the left lingula away such that the hilum could be addressed. When performing a video assisted thoracoscopic left upper lobectomy, a similar port arrangement is taken with two ports in the anterior axillary line and one port in the posterior axillary line. The utility port is the superior anterior port in the fourth to fifth intercostal space in the anterior axillary line. Once the incisions have been made, exploration of the chest is performed. Encircling, stapling, and dividing the left upper lobe pulmonary vein branches is the first step after the posterior hilum has been cleared. By sampling the lymph nodes, dissecting the posterior hilum, you can then perform the rest of the surgery in an anterior to posterior direction. By taking the mammary and the lung and separating them, this portion of the surgery can then be done. It is important to identify a left lower lobe pulmonary vein prior to encircling, stapling, and dividing the left upper lobe pulmonary vein. Once this has been performed, attention is then directed towards dividing the first branch of the pulmonary artery going to the left upper lobe. Once the first or second branch of the pulmonary artery going to the left upper lobe have been divided, you can encircle, staple, and divide the left upper lobe bronchus. It is important to make sure that you are not too close to the hilum and encircling the main bronchus and only encircling the left upper lobe bronchus. Sometimes when the dissection is too far out, you are inadvertently performing a lingular sparing left upper lobectomy, in which case this was not the desired procedure. So making sure that you are in the correct position will avoid any problems during surgery. Once the bronchus has been taken, the remaining branches of the pulmonary artery can then be taken with a separate stapler. When performing the hilar dissection, make sure that you do not inadvertently damage the left phrenic nerve running just anterior to the hilum of the lung. Adhesions can be seen where the left upper lobe is densely adherent to the left anterior chest wall. A port is placed just lateral to the area of the adhesions and is performed with videoscopic visualization. It is important to release the attachments of the lung from the pericardium. A bipolar electrocautery device such as the ligature or in-seal device can be used for such a dissection. That cautery device can also be used to separate the fissure, the major fissure separating the left upper lobe and the left lower lobe such that the hilum 
and the pulmonary artery branch, specifically the lingular branch, can be identified. At this time, dissecting the lung off of the pericardium is continued. A stapler is then used to divide the lung away from its attachments of the mediastinum by leaving a small rim of lung and anterior attached to the patent mammary, the lung is then separated and the left upper lobectomy can begin. A second firing of the stapler allows for division of the lung, additionally separating it from the patent mammary. By looking closely and examining the area of the clips underneath the scar tissue, you can see just medial to the staple line where the patent mammary exists. The ring clamp is demonstrating that location. A small amount of residual lung is then stapled once the patent mammary can be identified. The ring clamp is used to demonstrate that area of the patent mammary and elevate the lung away from that adjacent adhesion. By seeing the distal area, we can then safely staple, preserving the patent mammary. The final stapler is fired, completely dividing the lung away from all attachments. By suctioning the remaining blood left in the chest, one can see all of the staple lines from division of the pulmonary vein, the pulmonary artery branches, and the bronchus to the left upper lobe. The pulmonary artery remains patent, and the stapled wedge of lung, densely adherent to the pulmonary artery, is left within the chest. While we're on the topic of left upper lobectomy, it is important to note that one of the most common areas of injury is the first pulmonary artery branch of the left upper lobe. The dense lymph node adherence can sometimes make it difficult to dissect in this small window. Remember, release retraction of the lobe when stapling. Apply gentle pressure, silence the room, fold the lung down onto the area of injury. Event number four includes a 92-year-old man who is in excellent condition, who presented with a very distant 15-pack year smoking history. He had biopsy-proven right-sided squamous cell lung cancer with a concomitant lung lesion on the left side that was treated later on with SBRT. It was felt to be a second primary lung cancer. The right middle lobe lesion was surgically addressed. His endobronchial ultrasound mediastinal lymph node staging was negative. The lesion was FDG AVID on PET scan. He elected to proceed with the video-assisted thoracoscopic right middle lobe lobectomy. There are some subtle differences when performing a right middle lobectomy, which will be shown in the following diagrams. When performing a video-assisted thoracoscopic right middle lobectomy, it is important to make sure that dissection from the hilum begins from the anterior to posterior direction, making sure that the pulmonary vein branches going to the right upper lobe are preserved is paramount. The pulmonary vein branches to the right middle lobe may have an unusual angle, and sometimes a leader can facilitate passage safely around the pulmonary vein branch. Unlike other lobectomies, the second structure to be divided for a video-assisted thoracoscopic right middle lobectomy is more often the bronchus, as the artery sometimes will sit just posterior to the bronchus. The pulmonary artery branch going to the right middle lobe frequently sits slightly superior and slightly posterior to the right middle lobe bronchus branches. The right middle lobe bronchial branches will terminate into a bifurcation, becoming the medial and lateral segments of the right middle lobe. Just proximal to that is where the stapler should be fired, attempting to create as little of a stump as possible. Sometimes a leader can facilitate damaging the posterior lang pulmonary artery branch that is directly adjacent to the bronchus. It was during this portion of the surgery that we had incredible difficulty passing anything between the bronchus and the pulmonary artery, and it was at that point that we elected to convert rather than encounter bleeding deep into a hole in our attempt to separate the bronchus from the pulmonary artery. Once the bronchus is divided, and once that has been successfully navigated, a leader may again be used to encircle, staple, and divide the right middle lobe pulmonary artery branch going to the right middle lobe. The camera is inserted into the chest and we ensure that there is no evidence of metastatic disease.
the station 4R lymph nodes are then assessed thoracoscopically. The station 7 lymph nodes are then taken. The inferior pulmonary ligament and adjacent lymph nodes are then taken. The right middle lobe vein is then encircled, stapled, and divided, providing access to the subsequent bronchus that lies just posterior to that structure. Unfortunately, we are unable to separate the bronchus from the densely adherent pulmonary artery with a lymph node interposed in between. It is important to set time limits. We began a clock, and I reported to my team that after 30 minutes of dissection, trying to separate these structures from one another, if I was unsuccessful, that we would convert. In my opinion, it was unsafe to proceed as we continued to dissect. After several minutes have passed, we have still made no progress. The pulmonary artery branches to the right middle lobe remain densely adherent to the right middle lobe bronchus. The lymph node that is densely adherent in between these structures is unmovable. At this point, with a small amount of continued dissection, we elected to open the case. During opening, I was able to slide my hand into the extended anterior utility port without even using a retractor and to simply use my fingers to pass in between these structures and feel that there was a small fine membrane separating the two. Although I did convert, I feel very good about this conversion and do not feel that it was a failure because I did not end up with an injury to any of the pulmonary artery branches going to the right middle lobe. I feel certain that if I had continued to proceed in this manner, that pulmonary artery injury may have been higher risk in this particular case. Even after placing small sutures in the bronchus to allow for retracting it away from the pulmonary artery, we were unable to separate it, thus once again confirming that conversion was the appropriate measure to take. Additional tips. While collapsing the lung, exposure is key in VAT surgery. The lung must be out of your way. Be sure your endotracheal tube is in correct position and often be willing to assist anesthesia in placing and troubleshooting the endotracheal tube. Make sure your cuff is adequately inflated and make sure that the diaphragm is paralyzed during ventilation. You may need a bit of CO2 insufflation to allow the lung to collapse rapidly. Always be willing to change or add port placement when the angles do not seem correct. Make sure your camera allows you to see the vessels at all times. Do not dissect blindly. A 30 degree camera is key to having best angles unless you're taking a robotic approach. Back up the camera when there is bleeding to gain perspective and make sure that you do not acquire blood on your field. You must positively identify structures to, prior to dissection and division to avoid inadvertently resecting more lung than you intend to do. Keep the camera oriented as if it is an open view so that you do not become disoriented. An experienced camera driver is an invaluable tool when performing vatslobectomy. Develop a language that allows rapid communication, especially in an emergency. Identify other surrounding structures to be sure that they will be not injured, including the upper vein when dividing the lower lobe vein. Make sure your team knows where the emergency oxygen shutoff valve is in the event of an airway fire. Always have a tonsil sponge on a ring clamp on the back table and test your team regularly. Make it a habit. Immediately stop any distraction. Call everyone's attention to announce what you think may be the event or emergency in the middle of your lobectomy. Make sure everyone knows if you think you have an injury to a structure. Make sure that all music is turned off and everyone's attention is focused on the patient during your surgery. Source control is paramount. Catch up. Do not continue to dissect or move a clamp when hemostasis has been achieved while you're awaiting 
wait for blood to be brought into the room, stop the problem, gather hemostatic tools, clean the camera, and then make adjustment. Do not move your clamp on the hilum or move the pressure on the bleeding vessel until you have all of the appropriate tools to address the situation. Work on the repair only when the patient has stabilized. When using staplers, port placement is important. The camera port must be posterior enough so that the stapler lines up with the hilum. Access incisions should overlie major fissures. You should optimize stapler angles. Both using incision, reticulation, and camera optimization allow for the case to proceed better. In general, never force an instrument or a stapler. In event number two, you can clearly see what happens when that is done. Unlike open surgery, where with a hand present a little bit of twisting is helpful. Resistance means important tissue is in the way. Do not push when you feel resistance. Learn to enhance your haptic tools when performing VATS. Visual and haptic feedback can achieve a safer surgery. Visual cues substitute for tactile cues. Look for stretch on vascular structures. The direction of travel of vessels is also informative. Use a leader, such as a red rubber catheter, if the angle is not perfect or if you think the stapler may not easily pass. A curved tip also enhances passage around narrow angles. Beware of silk sutures which can cut through a pulmonary artery when too much tension is placed on the vessel. This next video shows passage of a leader to enhance safe passage around a pulmonary artery. This was a quite a large posterior ascending pulmonary artery. Some people believe that using a zero silk suture can enhance passing around the artery structures and passage of a stapler. It is important to make sure that when passing a silk suture around vessels that not too much pressure is applied to the vessel posteriorly. The silk should be fed into the port such that no tension ever exists around the pulmonary artery. A right angle clamp can be used to grasp the tip of the leader device or the tip of the leader device can be placed at the tip of the silk suture. The silk suture can then be removed once the leader is safely passed around the structure. When passing the stapler that is attached to the leader, it is important to make sure that all of these devices are passed in the same direction. Simply pulling the leader out towards the port would result in avulsing this pulmonary artery branch. It is important that a separate structure is used to grasp the leader and pull it towards the head of the patient for this right upper lobectomy posterior artery pulmonary artery dissection. Using the leader and making sure that it is properly used will allow enhancement of passage around difficult angles. In this particular case, a leader may not have been necessary, but it was important for me to demonstrate to you how to safely use a leader and how to prevent avulsing an artery when using it to enhance your stapler passage. Always be aware of the silk suture applying too much pressure on a pulmonary artery. This next case is my very first VAT slobectomy I ever attempted to perform. My staplers were passed through both the camera port and the anterior port. I have subsequently started to place my camera port much farther posteriorly. I had seen the courses from Dr. McKenna, Dr. Swanson, and Dr. D'Amico, and at that time was using a utility port, an anterior port, an auscultory incision, and a camera port. It was during the time of this surgery that I completed very successfully division of the pulmonary vein to the right upper lobe, the pulmonary artery branches to the right upper lobe, and all I had left to do was simply to divide the bronchus. Again, as one can safely see, the pulmonary vein branches to the right upper lobe had already been divided, the truncus anterior branches of the pulmonary artery had been encircled, stapled, and divided, and the bronchus to the right upper lobe was the structure that is now being demonstrated as the only final thing that needed to be divided.
While passing the stapler, I found it very difficult because my angles from my port were not perfect. My retraction of the lung was in the wrong direction. My port angles were not good. I did not use haptic feedback. I did not feel the resistance as I passed the stapler through the beginning and the end part of the membranous portion of the right upper lobe bronchus. I successfully stapled the front end of the right upper lobe bronchus and left the membranous portion of the right upper lobe bronchus. After firing the stapler, I was looking down into the lumen of the right upper lobe. It was at that point that I elected to perform a bronchoplastic closure with an interrupted 4 PDS suture, closing the right upper lobe bronchus with a VATS. Unfortunately, my very first VATS right upper lobectomy turned into a VATS right upper lobe bronchoplasty as I had to hand sew the bronchus closed to salvage the situation. The lesson I learned from this case was to use my visual cues. I clearly had passed the stapler through the bronchus instead of around it. I also learned not to push the stapler when I felt resistance. When performing a leak test, we clearly saw that there was leakage from the right upper lobe. Early in the learning curve, make sure you understand anatomy. Learn to feel normal and abnormal passage of an instrument. Clear the entry and exit points by removing lymph nodes. Most errors can be repaired. In this case, the bronchus was closed with interrupted 4O vicral suture. The patient had an uneventful recovery. 4O PDS suture or 4O vicral suture can be used to close the bronchus. This is the actual image of my first patient, and you can see where I made my mistakes by placing too many ports and ports in appropriate angles. I have now learned to have better port placement and better angles, and if at any time I have difficulty with an angle, I will place an additional port to enhance my ability to gain a better angle. Placing an additional port is not a failure. Conversion to open is not a failure. Port placement is important. Camera ports must be posterior enough so that the stapler lines up with the hilum. The access incision should overlie the major fissure. Optimizing stapler angles allows you to have better incisions and reticulation. What if you cannot find a lesion? This may lead to removal of the wrong portion of the lung. Know the anatomy of the CAT scan. Learn how to triangulate the lesion using CT-guided landmarks. You can either use injection of methylene blue from electromagnetic navigational bronchoscopy, a fiducial marker, injection of radionucleotide tracer, or anatomic landmarks such as the azagous vein, the inferior pulmonary vein, or fissures. You can divide the chest into thirds, anterior, middle, and posterior into an AP dimension. Using such triangulation can allow for a blind wedge, perhaps a segmental resection, to make a diagnosis. Watch for progress in the time of the operation. If a step is taking inordinately long, there is a problem. The tendency is to try to go faster, but if a step is in question, is difficult, it may lead to problems. For example, dissecting the first branch of the left pulmonary artery in an upper lobectomy. If that portion of the surgery takes too long and the lymph node appears to be too adherent, then perhaps converting to open is prudent. If you are not satisfied, then open and never compromise the operation. What if you cannot see the anatomy? If you cannot see well during the surgery, even if the lung is deflated, this can lead to injury to vascular structures. Generally, it is due to poor port placement. The camera is too anterior and the heart is in the way. The camera could be too inferior and the diaphragm can be in the way. The ports cannot be centered well in the inner space, leading to an inability to move the instruments in all directions. Wait several minutes, during which time the problem is reviewed with your team and appropriate measures are readied. Make sure there is blood in the room. Make sure a thoracotomy kit is ready to go. Make sure you have plans A, B, and C developed. Do not put a clamp on an injury in a pool of blood, as this will cause further injury.
Pulmonary vein bleeding. Using a small profile stapler may lessen bleeding between the staple lines. I prefer to use a gray load stapler such that back bleeding on the pulmonary vein is not as much of a problem. I also like to use a gray load for small pulmonary artery branches as it provides a tighter stapler line. For pulmonary artery branches, I prefer a tan load. For regular lung parenchyma and bronchus, a purple or green load. For thick lung parenchyma, I prefer a black load. What about bleeding from the lung or parenchyma? Avoid trying to place large sponges through a small hole, generally seen in redo cases where adhesions are significant. Bovi on very high setting and arcing to tissue will help if bleeding is from the raw surface. If pulmonary hypertension is present, then reinflating the lung sometimes can help as this lowers the pulmonary artery pressure. Occasionally, reapproximated visceral pleura over the raw area will also help. What about leakage from the bronchus? This is a rare problem where the staple line dehisses or is inadequate. It is easy to suture, but be sure the mechanism for the problem is understood. If tension is present, the reason must be relieved, and it may require a sleeve resection. If the staple line is too oblique and not at a right angle, then again a sleeve resection may be necessary. Always test your suture line and make sure underwater that the lesion, the bronchial staple line, has hermetically sealed. Although this is quite rare, it is very important to make sure that this has not happened. In a right lower lobectomy, where the middle lobe is pinched by the bronchial staple line, you should always make sure that you inflate the right middle lobe and upper lobe prior to encircling, stapling, and dividing the right lower lobe bronchus. Always see the middle lobe take off and course prior to dividing the lower lobe. However, even though you can see the right middle lobe bronchus, make sure that you insufflate it easily as sometimes the stapler can cause pinching of the orifice. Sometimes bronchoscopy may provide additional assistance. A sleeve resection and reimplantation of the middle lobe is a last resort, but a possible solution to this problem. What about space problems in air leak? A leak with the space problem is usually not an issue. Be sure your lung fills the space at the conclusion of the operation by watching it re-expand after placing the chest tube. If the lung does not re-expand, then perform the typical maneuvers to help this. Take down the ligament, perform a pleural tent, a nerve injection for temporary paralysis, or omentum or a muscle flap. If a leak is present from a deep injury, you may require sutures if significant leak is present, then be sure to use two chest tubes with one in between the lung and access incision to prevent subcutaneous emphysema from developing. In some cases, a pulmonary artery may dissect. During this portion of the surgery, the pulmonary artery simply turns black. Be aware of this and do not continue to dissect onto a pulmonary artery that has started to separate within the wall. A black pulmonary artery is a warning of impending pulmonary artery rupture. The pathologic specimen shows where the pulmonary artery clearly dissected, and an elective conversion in this case will prevent you from having a problem. What about pulmonary vein bleeding? The pulmonary vein is an extremely low pressure system. Bright red blood instead of dark red blood happens when you have pulmonary vein bleeding. This will stop with compression and time. In unusual situations whereby this is a problem and pressure does not allow for cessation of bleeding, there may be other tissue caught in the stapler, such as pericardium or a fibrotic lymph node. Make sure you appreciate that a vein branch is controlled or not controlled during the dissection of a lobar vein, especially when performing segmentectomies, such as the superior segmental vein during lower lobe vein resection. Things to watch for. A common pulmonary vein can be present and result in an inadvertent pneumonectomy. Be aware that you are always identifying upper and lower lobe pulmonary vein branches prior to dividing one or the other. A right middle lobe vein should also be preserved during right upper lobectomy. Make sure you're able to identify a small right upper lobe posterior ascending pulmonary artery. Additional left posterior left upper lobe pulmonary artery branches are often fraught with disaster when the surgeon is not aware that these remaining branches exist. Make sure you pass behind the bronchus for a left upper lobectomy, densely holding on to the bronchus as you pass posteriorly, taking care to avoid the pulmonary artery.
Watch for adherent lymph nodes. Make sure you're constantly aware of the tension on the lung during stapling. One of the most dangerous weapons is a stapler with an errant clip coming out of the tip. The suction keeps the stapler in place and can cause damage to vessels when the sucker is passed around bleeding. Forcing a sponge on a ring clamp through a small opening can result in plunging the sponge into lung parenchyma, causing bleeding. Beware of any assistance pushing clamps into the chest against resistance. Once that resistance is overcome, there is tremendous pressure and can result in underlying lung injury. Make sure that no staples, especially 10 millimeter clips, have been placed anywhere near the jaws of a stapler, as dragging the 10 millimeter clip along the firing of a stapler gun with the knife can cause ripping and tearing of a pulmonary artery rather than safely stapling and cutting in between each staple line. Some additional pearls include placing another trocar if the angle is not good, don't be afraid to open, use leads to navigate, and remember that pressure controls 90% of bleeding. If you're having difficulty and feel you may be close to pulmonary artery bleeding in a morbidly obese patient, convert early as entering the patient in a timely manner may be difficult. These patients cannot have an efficient thoracotomy and sometimes finding a deep retractor is difficult. Positioning obese patients is critical for having adequate angles. Be aware of anatomic variations. These may exist. Don't be afraid to change the order of dividing vessels in bronchus. If the posterior branch of the left upper lobe artery is proximal enough, taking it next will make the bronchus easier. Sometimes it is too far behind the bronchus to be taken first. Therefore, typically the next step is to take the bronchus. Other complications that can occur include esophageal injury, thoracic duct injury, other vascular injuries such as a subclavian vessel, superior vena cava, or heart injury, or a diaphragm injury. Always be aware that these are possible. Be aware of your anatomy. Always look at as many educational materials as you can to learn the regular anatomic variations, as the pulmonary artery and bronchial branches are not always predictable. Video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery is beneficial to patients. Intraoperative complications are rare. Knowledge of anatomy is essential to avoiding problems. Visual cues are key. If there is any concern, the surgeon should convert to an open procedure. There is an old truth in aviation. The reasons you get into trouble become the reasons you don't get out of it. Always remember in VAT surgery the tremendous benefit that can confer to the patient. Minimize blood loss, shorten length of stay, reduce pain, potentially enhanced recovery, even leading to better delivery of adjuvant chemotherapy. Remember these and always do not hesitate to ask for assistance. Remember that sometimes, even in the best of circumstances, a conversion is the safest thing to perform. And remember that problems can always happen no matter how far along you are in your career. Be transparent about these problems and talk to other people and teach others what mistakes you make so that everyone can learn. Thank you for your attention.